please welcome Christian Hackey. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, yeah, and thank you, David, for being a, a lone voice who stood up for me, even when my own Archbishop uh, didn't. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was really, really grateful for that. Um, I'm from the Centre for Bioethical Reform, uh, and I am the, their public engagement officer. Um, so that's my job. I've been doing that for about seven years. Just to, if you want to know a bit about who we are, so this, so this is our umbrella organisation. We do street displays educating on abortion, but we've also got a number of projects underneath us. Breathos on the left engages churches. Post-abortion support for everyone is for people who have had abortions. One in three women, would you believe, in the UK have had at least one abortion by the age of 45 in this country. We've also got Hope Pregnancy. That's our response to um, people in an unexpected pregnancy. And then Progressive Education is loads of wonderful resources, age appropriate, uh, that people can use to take the truth of abortion or start the conversation on abortion in schools at a primary and secondary level. Now, before I start, it is worth stating that because abortion figures are so high, that we are only ever an inch away from someone who has had an abortion. Right? And this, the stats being that people in this room may have had an abortion. So whilst what I'm going to say today, it will be hard hitting, and I will be giving people an opportunity later on to see a one minute silent abortion procedure video. The purpose of this is not to shock or to shame or to condemn, but ultimately to inform, right? Because we can't heal from abortion until we know what abortion is. Okay, so if that's you, I'm not here today to condemn you, but actually I want to catapult you onto a healing journey and we've got oodles of resources um, to help you on that. But allow me to start with this man here. Adam Hochschild, author of King Leopold's Ghost and Bury the Chains, and in his book he wrote this, if in that year, 1787, you had stood on a London street corner, or a Pulper street corner, and insisted that slavery was morally wrong and should be abolished, nine out of ten listeners would have laughed you off as crackpot. The tenth might have agreed with you in principle, but assured you that ending slavery was wildly impracticable because the British Empire's economy depended upon it. Yet, within a few short years, this niche issue had become centre stage in British political life. The question is, why? And the answer to that is because in 1787, a group of men met in a printing shop um, in Gray's Inn in London and started resourcing and strategising towards the end of slavery. Among them we had Thomas Buxton, Granville Sharp, Thomas Clarkson, Zachary Macaulay, and William Wilberforce. None of them were slaves. None of them were slave owners. In fact, slavery was happening thousands of miles away in the West Indies. There, there could have, it could have easily been argued that they had no responsibility to be involved. However, compelled by their Christian faith, um, they concluded that they did have a moral responsibility, that the slaves' blood was on their hands, that they had to speak up for those who could not speak for themselves. And so, what followed was 20 long years of networking, travelling, debating, sickness, death threats, and crushing political defeats, until, on the 25th of March 1807, the transatlantic slave trade was finally abolished in the United Kingdom. So, why do I start by highlighting a group of politically minded men, different century, different injustice, wrong gender, you could argue. After all, men don't get pregnant, I've never been pregnant, nor are men always the primary caregivers uh, when the child finally does come and see the halogen lamps of an NHS ward. It could also be argued that it would be a stupid move for a, a, a young political party to take this on, okay? But I would argue that those arguments and attitudes like it have led to not only the bullish, illogical and toxic debate that we see played out in public political life, but more seriously to this, ever increasing numbers of dead. Since abortion was legalised in 1967, we have violently wiped out over 10 million unborn babies in England and Wales. Okay, when you calculate the global figure of abortion, which is 73 million abortions worldwide, we have wiped out 7% of the global population. 
fueled by false ideologies of overpopulation and other things. And this is why I'm calling everybody in politics and out of politics to wade right back into this debate immediately. And over the next 25 minutes, I want to persuade you um, why we should do that. Here's a brief roadmap of where we're going today. I'm going to be going at quite a pace because I've only got um, half an hour. But let's start with this, Britain's pro-life heritage. Now, sometimes it takes an American to say it how it is. And strangely enough, this is the, certainly the case with regard to Britain's pro-life heritage. Anyone who's taken time to read uh, the historic Supreme Court opinion on Roe v. Wade, overturning it, that is, hallelujah, um, will be struck by how much of it is devoted to British common law. Okay, Sir William Blackstone on the left, founder of the now lucrative bookshop, um, 17th, 17th century British legal scholar who viewed abortion as a, quote, heinous misdemeanor, is mentioned no less than 24 times in Justice Alito's opinion. He's the gentleman on the left there. So why is Blackstone given so much time? Well, in order to answer the question of whether abortion fits within the American Constitution, Alito needs to establish where the American Constitution flowed from, which was British common law, as founded upon Christo Judo principles. Okay? And what Alito discovers is that Blackstone viewed abortion as a crime from the moment a baby could be felt. Nor was he alone in this. Okay? All of the British legal authorities, the big dogs that informed the American Constitution, okay, were all of one mind. Let me quote just one footnote from Alito's opinion. Bracken, Coke, Hale and Blackstone, all legal authorities, all wrote that post-quickening abortion, that's once the baby can be felt, around 16 weeks, was a crime. Okay? Many authorities asserted that even pre-quickening abortion was unlawful and that as a result an abortionist was guilty of murder if woman died from the attempt. Okay? So this is, pre, um, this is the, the common law view in British law from the Magna Carta to the Millennium Dome. Okay? And even the 1967 law, for those who, are, who know it, okay, doesn't actually um, decriminalise abortion. Okay, all it does is it gives um, protection from criminal sanction to women having an abortion if they can fulfill five criteria, okay, or if they fit within a, one of five criteria. Okay? Our heritage is pro-life. Okay, as late as the Victorian era, the 1961 Offences Against the Person Act made it a crime not only to have an abortion by chemical or mechanical means, but also to aid and abet in an abortion. It also made it a crime to try to conceal a baby that had been killed by an abortion. It is therefore no wonder that the UK abortion lobby has been trying to abolish this law for the last decade, as they simultaneously seek to supply abortion pills into women's homes and instruct women to flush their unborn babies down the toilet. Okay? But understanding the history will make you realise that the abortion lobby's legal argument is skin deep because our heritage is pro-life. So, what does the science say? Um, we're going to rattle through this. Um, human development begins at fertilisation. This marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. A zygote is the beginning of a new human being, i.e. an embryo. This is Keith L. Moore, the developing human, clinical oriented, orientated embryology, 7th edition. How about this man, Professor Michelin Matthew Ross from Harvard University Med Medical School. It is scientifically correct to say that an individual human being begins, a human life begins at conception. What about Dr. Watson A. Bowles from the University of Colorado Medical School? By all criteria of modern molecular biology, life is present from the moment of conception. Okay? These are not quasi-professionals working in queer study departments at Pulver Polytechnic here. Okay? These are credible scientists in credible institutions who don't have an axe to grind, affirming the simple biological fact that human life begins from fertilization. But perhaps the best way to convince you of this is simply to show you. The following video is a non-graphic educational video developed by the Endowment for Human Development, which shows you just what human life looks like from the earliest stages in the womb. I'm not going to play it in its entirety because time is tight. A touch to the mouth area causes the embryo to reflexively withdraw its head. The external ear is beginning to take shape. 
By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen, along with a startle response. Okay. You're gonna, have to, you guys are gonna have to watch that video um, on YouTube. I can send you the link to it. Okay, but you get the impression. Okay, at six weeks, right at the moment when people are actually discovering that they're pregnant, <laughs> you don't have a blob of cells. You don't have a single-celled organism. You have a complex child that is responding to stimuli. It's moving its arms and legs, and it's hiccuping. Okay, and, and that development only increases as the um, days and weeks go on. Okay, so. Scientifically speaking, okay, it doesn't matter if you are a single-celled zygote on the left or a multi-trillion cell 24-year-old female on the right, you are a human being. Okay? At every point in that journey, you are distinct, living, whole, genetically human. Okay? The fact that the baby is small, that a number of baby is small, less developed, in a different environment or dependent on the mother for life, does not change its humanity. Okay? After all, these Thai footballers were dependent on others for life, but I don't remember Vigo Mortensen and Colin Farrell discussing outside the Thai cave whether they were human or not in their epic biopic retelling currently available on Amazon Prime. I'm not sponsored by them. Okay? I don't remember people saying of the Chilean miners that perhaps bringing them out of the mine would traumatise them and make them a burden on society. Okay? Wouldn't it, have been, wouldn't it have been saved a lot of fact that they just covered over the air hole? Again, I don't think Antonio Banderas would have wanted to star in that film. What about this man? Finally, the renowned physicist Stephen Hawkins. Yes, he did solve some pretty big intergalactic problems, but wouldn't it have been better if he hadn't existed? Okay, one person I know who would contest that is Eddie Redmayne, because his Oscar would be at stake there. Okay. No, we don't tolerate these arguments for born people. Why do we tolerate them for unborn people? It doesn't make scientific or philosophical sense. But that does not mean that there isn't logic in the madness. Okay? And I can only deal with this briefly here. If you want to know more, you're going to have to view one of our, um, join one of our online courses. But ultimately, this stuff comes down to words. Okay? When you go back in history, all human rights violations follow a similar pattern. The victim is first dehumanized in the language that is used about them, and then they can be done away with at will. Take, for example, these um, four human rights injustice, okay? We've got um, slavery, how were slaves referred to as? Property, as cargo, as Negroes. In the Holocaust, Jews were referred to as rats, vermin, udementia. Um, and later, they were given numbers tattooed on them. Why is that? Because you don't kill a number, you delete it. Okay, the Japanese biological testing camps referred to their inmates as marutas. Okay, that's Japanese for log. Okay, and finally Rwanda, Hutus referred to Tutsis as cockroaches before killing half a million, million of them. You get the picture. So what's going on in the UK? Well, in unsuspecting clinics like this one in Maidstone, this one in Dagenham, this one in Brixton, or this one, um, not too far away in Brighton, right? Hundreds of thousands of babies are being killed. Fearfully and wonderfully made, dehumanized in the words, and then destroyed with chemicals, suction devices, or sharp tools. David mentioned this earlier. This is um, the clinic in Richmond, Manchester, and Ealing. Between them, 17,000 babies have been killed in these clinics in 2021 alone. And it's illegal to ban prep, like it's illegal to pray outside. Okay? It can, you can be arrested for praying outside, something that I have first-hand experience of. Okay? It was such a novel experience, the policeman forgot to caution me, uh, which means the whole case fell apart. Um, I was mildly disappointed myself, actually, because I was hoping for an epic moment. Whatever you say may be used against you in the court of law. But basically stuck me in the back of the police van and said, Oh, crumbs, I forgot. Um, whatever I... Um, yeah, uh, uh, nice, you know. It's a shocker all round, really. But the point being here is, isn't it interesting that the first place 
where prayer is being criminalised is where children are being sacrificed. Let that not go unnoticed. And by my calculations, 200,000 square metres of land, and that is now criminal to pray in, in the UK. If the Bournemouth and PSPO goes through, that will be doubled. So, what does the British Pregnancy Advisory Service say about abortion? Well, they say an abortion is the termination of a pregnancy. Up to 15 weeks, the pregnancy is removed by gentle suction with local anaesthetic. Can you see the, the careful way in which abortion is being euphemized and disguised? And that's why the best first step in addressing abortion is simply to use correct words. They're not pregnancies being ended, but babies being killed. These are not terminations, but procedures that intentionally end the life of an innocent human being. It is not health care when, when somebody healthy dies. Okay? Until we learn to speak correctly about this, the figures won't drop. Why is that not working? There we go. So, these are the 2021 figures. 214,869 abortions performed in 2021. That's, break, that's broken records for five consecutive years. That works out at 800 uh, abortions every working day. 5,000 babies were killed because they had a disability. 40 of them were killed just because they had cleft lip and palate. 859 were killed um, because they had Down syndrome. That's a 23% increase on the year before. 88 babies were killed in 2021 because they did not meet the numerical preference of their parents following an IVF procedure. Now, if unborn babies are clumps of cells like a bunion or a decaying tooth, then these figures would not matter. Cut them out, pull them out, who cares? If, however, the science is true and that these are all human beings, then this statistically constitutes the largest humanitarian crisis in modern history. Oh, how far have we fallen from our heritage? So we've looked at our pro-life heritage, we've looked at the science, we've looked at the current situation and scratched the surface on a little on how we got here. The question remains, well, how are we to deal with it? Or more precisely, how are we to rewire the nation that has been indoctrinated into thinking that unborn babies aren't humans? Well, let's go back to these two gentlemen, William Woolforce and Thomas Clarkson. Because it was this exact question that they met to discuss in that printing shop in 1787. And it was Clarkson on the right who really had the strategic edge here. Because Clarkson realised that the British public only saw the benefits of slavery. The cotton, the sugar, the rum, the commerce. They were never aware of what human cost it was coming. Recognising this, he took six months travelling up and down the country on horseback, gathering evidence on what slavery really does, including thumb screws and um, you know, other torture implements to show people what um, the slave trade was really doing. He, along with others, was instrumental in getting the victims of slavery, people like Orlando Equiano, to tell their stories. They pioneered the use of graphic images, slaves being branded um, as property. They inspired other artists like William Blake. This picture's graphic. This is a William Blake um, uh, print um, showing the reality of slave trade elsewhere. Perhaps most famously was this image. This is the Brooks's slave ship. Um, Clarkson got his hands on the blueprint. They then worked into the blueprint what it would have looked like under light packing. This is 487 um, human slaves depicted on two floors, although on one of the trips of, this, on, of the Brooks's ship, according to the ship ledger, 744 human beings were taken across the transatlantic passage. Okay. This image was put in pubs, in people's homes, and it was designed to horrify people into the reality of the slave trade. And images like this were responsible for huge changes in public opinion. Because time's short, I'm going to jump through to 1955 here. This is Emmett Till. At the age of 14, he was brutally kidnapped, tortured and murdered by two white racists. His body was shipped back from Money, Mississippi to Chicago, under which his mum was ordered to not let anyone see the body. But mum, Emmett's mum demanded that it be opened, and she then took the very brave decision to have an open casket funeral. Despite the enormous pain this caused her, 
She said this, and I quote, I had to let the world see what had happened because there's no way I could describe this and I needed somebody to help me tell it what it was like. Okay, so this next image is graphic. This is Emmett Till's body lying in state. Now this um, image is accredited with the start of the civil rights movement. Okay, it spread like wildfire um, through um, the publication in Jet magazine. It inspired Rosa Parks a hundred years later when she was reflecting on why she didn't move from the back of the bus. She said, I thought of Till and I um, kept on moving. And it also had a huge impact on the work of Martin Luther King. Okay, you see, Martin Luther King recognized the power of exposing justice to move the heart of the nation into action. That's why he used images like this to shame America before the world. Okay, he wanted to move those, quote, good-hearted white people from off the fence on the racism issue and into the ranks of the civil rights movement. I can never put it as well as Martin Luther King himself said, like a boil that can never be cured so long, it is, so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. And so from these, we learn three simple lessons about social reform. One, in order to change public policy, you need to change public opinion. Two, no social reformer has ever ended in injustice by covering it up. And three, change rarely occurs unless the cost of maintaining the status quo becomes unbear unbearable. In a therapeutic society, Pro the pro-life movement needs to realise that you cannot change human behaviour until you change the way humans feel. Okay? And we don't need to reinvent the wheel on this. Okay? I'm going to show you some graphic images now in other issues that have, are already doing this kind of work. So first graphic image is Alan Kurdi. Right? This image was accredited with changing David Cameron's view on the slavery crisis, um, on the immigration crisis in 2015 overnight. Anti-smoking campaigns have reduced smoking from 46% in 1974 to 19% in 2014. Images like this have become commonplace in comic relief. They raised over a billion pounds a few years ago. You get the picture. Images work. And it is building off these principles that CBR UK seeks to show people what abortion actually is. We do so sensitively and non-judgmentally, but we have to show the truth. Okay, so what I'm going to give you now is an opportunity to see a one minute video showing what surgical abortion looks like between 10 and 24 weeks. That's the current UK cutoff. There is no sound. You can look away. You can close your eyes if you want. I will let you know once the video is finished. In the words of Greg Cunningham, injustice that is concealed becomes tolerable. But the converse is also true. Injustice that is exposed becomes intolerable. And the reason why so many political parties are able to not have clear stances on the abortion issue is because it's still happening behind closed doors, in a clinics, in people's homes, etc. We need people to unveil the truth. And this is why point one of my, um, my application of this strategy today is to do just that, unveil the truth. We at CBR UK use large um, banners on the streets to show the humanity and value of unborn children on the left and the reality of abortion on the right. There's no reason why you as a party can't do this on a smaller scale, by putting baby images in your manifesto, by describing abortion procedures at your hustings or sharing CBR UK content online. Point two. You need to confront the culture, okay? You cannot win wars without battles, and so we must not be afraid to, conf we must not be afraid to confront people about this. Um, this was us outside of King's University this Wednesday. These women came out to block our banners, and this is really the best response people can, can come up with to abortion, simply to cover it up. But it's not them that you need to persuade. It's all the people looking in on that circumstance that will be the people that you need to persuade. Because conflict attracts interest, not just from people in the moment, but it attracts interest online. This was a display in Cardiff that reached 140,000 people. The media come out, they flock. The media flock to conflict like a fly to feces, I'm telling you, okay? 
And this is one example, you know, Yahoo News taking, um, taking the truth and spreading it far further than we ever could uh, because of a display. So we need to unveil the truth, we need to confront the culture, and finally, we need to accept persecution. Okay? Successful social reform always invites some form of aggression, lies and harm. Okay? If you're not experiencing these things, you should probably question how effective you're being. This woman on the left attacked one of our educators in Norwich. On the right, this was this Wednesday, the greatest middle class attack I've ever undergone. Somebody splitting open their compost bag full of avocado seeds on my car. Okay? We mustn't be afraid of this. Rather, we should welcome and expect it. Or to use somebody else's words, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. So we have to do these three things and take heart. As we do, lives will be saved. That baby is called Miracle. She was saved because her parents saw our display. This baby, um, the woman had taken the first medical abortion pill, changed her mind, and that baby is now alive and well, born in 2014. This girl we still know. Um, here she is now, saved from our displays. This is a, uh, a woman um, in Australia said, I am pregnant and people including the father wants me to have one. After watching these pictures, I refuse to. You see, this stuff, um, it saves lives and finally, it changes minds. So to finish, I just want to show you a little video of how people on the streets in Oxford responded to the abortion video you just saw. Oh, no sound there. Is there sound? No worries if not. Okay, we had some, some problem there. Okay, anyway, never mind that. So, to finish, will the Heritage Party unveil the injustice of abortion? Will you confront the culture? Will you accept persecution? Your effectiveness depends on it. Thank you very much. I'm Christian Hacking. Um, if you want to give feedback, you can sign that. I'll leave it up there just for 30 seconds or so before the next speaker comes up. Thanks for listening. Um, thank you so much, Christian. Um, it is shocking to see an abortion uh, actually happen. Um, and it's shocking that 10 million unborn children have been killed in this country and it's something that is a horror. So we take that stance and I'm, yes. I've been told by some people, oh, don't mention it, don't be pro-life, you know, just keep your mouth quiet about that, then you'll attract more people and then you can get into Parliament and change things. But if we don't make a stand on it now, when will we make a stand on it? Because we have to save the lives of the 200,000 children every year who are being killed. So, thank you so much for coming to speak to us, um, Christian, uh, from, the, uh, from CBR UK.